good afternoon. We would like to start. So uh, good afternoon again. Uh, I'm Guy Rolnik. I'm the co-organizer of the uh, conference, and we're happy to uh, host you uh, for what has been, and I'm sure will continue to be a series of uh, insightful and engaging discussions on digital platforms, markets, and democracy. This afternoon, we are delighted to have a conversation with Hal and Fiona, moderated by David, which will start with a short uh, presentation by Hal. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Before we begin, please remember that we are on the record and live streaming. And now allow me to briefly introduce our guests. Hal Varian is the chief economist at Google. Since 2002, he has been involved in many aspects of the company, including auction design, econometric analysis, finance, corporate strategy, and public policy. Hal also holds academic appointments at UC Berkeley in business, economics, and information management. He has published numerous papers and is the author of major economics textbooks that have been translated into 22 languages. He is also the co-author of a best-selling book on business strategy and wrote a monthly column for the New York Times from 2000 to 2007. Fiona Scott Morton is the Theodore Nuremberg Professor of Economics at Dell University School of Management. She generously accepted to serve as our Economy and Market Structure Subcommittee, and we are thankful for that. Fiona also served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and previously taught at Booth, Stanford, among others. David Dian is a journalist and the incoming executive editor at American Prospect Magazine. He is a contributing writer to Salon and also writes for The Intercept, The New Republic, and The Fiscal Times. His first book, Chain of Title, about Wall Street foreclosure fraud, was released in 2016. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. You know, the invitation is a bit like an uh, invitation to dinner with cannibals. You don't know if you're eating dinner or you are dinner. So we'll see, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, let's see. Okay. So I said I would give 10 slides, and the 10 slides are just there to kind of set a context, raise some points, and we can discuss these points and other things uh, later. There's this big debate going on in the economics community about the role of concentration and competition. Uh, there are two interpretations of increase in concent and concentration. One is you have superstar firms with high productivity, capture a larger share of the market. That's capitalism at its best. That's the way markets work. The alternative, you've got anti-competitive forces whereby dominant firms are able to prevent actual and potential rivals from entering and expanding. So there's a literature being written on this. Uh, if you look at Alter et al., uh, they found the industries that became more concentrated with, with those in which were the greatest productivity increases. Now, that's not a causal statement. That's just correlation. But in fact, there's also some work going on trying to pin down exactly what the uh, mechanisms are that explain this uh, phenomenon. Is it competition, or is it, in fact, anti-competition? So that's uh, ongoing discussion, maybe. By next year, there will be some progress in answering those questions. Now, people ask me, well, look at search. Take search as an example. Where is the competition in search? My claim is, if you look at web search, it's really a tough business. You can only sell 6% of what you produce. Because you're producing all these organic and paid clicks. And it's only the paid clicks that go to support the operation of the uh, company. Those are the ad clicks. And competition is really intense for those ad clicks. Amazon, now, when people start shopping, 51% of the people in the US start at Amazon. They want those clicks. They want people to directly come to their site. And they've established a very strong brand so that many people do start their search activity by doing that. But it's not just Amazon. There's e eBay, Yelp, Travelocity, Expedia, Orbitz, on and on and on and on. We've got many, many businesses that are competing with Google. Google is offering you, offering you this guide to whatever you want, 
Uh, they're saying, no, we have a strong brand. We've given you good service in the past. You should come to us directly, not go through this uh, intermediary. Now, nobody really cares about these non-commercial clicks. There's book search, there's scholar search, there's patent search, there's encyclopedia search, on and on and on. And even though each of those examples dominate their market in some sense, you can look at uh, uh, some cases where there are you know, competition and let's say scholar search, but um, nobody cares about that because the money is involved. So we, even though I think uh, Fiona talked about free being a, uh, not being a special price. I think that's fair, but I also think it's fair that it's really the commercial side that's attracted all the interest uh, on the antitrust. And in fact, when you look at the tech firms, you see intense competition, not just in core competencies, but all over the place. So here's Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, the big five. They compete in advertising platforms, artificial intelligence, browsers, cloud services, ebooks, email and messaging games, on and on and on. <clears throat> and that competition can be very intense. So, for example, we were talking about the Amazon Echo. A couple years ago, Amazon comes up with this new product, a speech driven product, uh, captured a lot of market interest and attention. Nine months later, Google came out with its own uh, speech uh, system for answering questions, its own. Uh, assistant, and uh, of course now that competition rages quite intensely between these two companies with more on the way. So there's a lot of competition in all of these different verticals, not just on a product by product basis, but across this whole range of uh, products. Innovation, another important point. So in this uh, diagram, in this chart, I've got the red indicating GAFM, the big five that I referred to a few minutes ago. The kind of bluish purple thing is other tech companies like Samsung. Uh, Pharma is the light blue. And then we have the uh, automobile companies in green. I was a little surprised to see the auto companies as the top R&D spenders, but when you think about it, they have this, exiden sorry, this uh, threat, existential threat going on uh, in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles and, of course, electric vehicles. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of investment in R&D there as well. And I will tell you, there's a little debate between Amazon and Alphabet about who deserves first place. Google splits out its R&D expenditure at its 10K, and Amazon doesn't. So this is uh, uh, some interpolation going on here. Google acquisitions, we hear a lot about that. You're grabbing up these small companies. Well, there are really two big acquisitions in Google's history. One was Motorola, the other was HTC. Motorola was then spun off again three years later because the primary motivation of acquiring Motorola was to acquire patents and mobile uh, devices. HTC was a case where HTC was closing a plant in, tai in uh, Taiwan, and we took on a few thousand uh, engineers there because we needed that expertise. In fact, 25% of Google's acquisitions had three or fewer employees, which is pretty amazing. 60% had 10 or fewer, 75% 18 or fewer. So really, these are not acquisitions in the sense that people are thinking of it in a market context. These are acquihires, as we call them in Silicon Valley. You're acquiring the, ac you're, you're going through the acquisition in order to get the talent that's available in the firm. And in most cases, the uh, companies are very happy to be um, acquired. And if you go to the famous uh, Wikipedia entry on acquisitions by Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, I count 800 acquisitions in the last 40 years because Apple and Microsoft go back uh, uh, that long. But all the companies you hear mentioned are a handful. I mean, four or five companies that are mentioned as problems. Well, that's l less than a 1% error. So I would say the FTC and the DOJ are doing pretty well, even if you make the provision that these acquisitions were problematic, which I'm not doing, but I, but I want to point out it's a very small fraction of the, of the total. Kill zone. So we've all heard about the kill zone. That's an area not worth operating in since defeat is guaranteed. Now, is that a real thing? Well, let's look at Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, US, China, Europe. Everybody says we've got an AI initiative we're going to pour all this money into AI. We're going to change the world. And so no startup would be stupid enough to enter into that battle with all of these giants, not just companies, but whole countries, 
Well, in fact, there's 630 companies that were created in uh, 2016 that, in fact, are primarily or centrally investing in AI technology. Now, realistically, we all know they're not all going to IPO. Majority of them, in fact, will end up being acquisitions, but that's been true for decades. That's nothing new. If you look, uh, go back to 1990, look at the records, there are five times as many acquisitions as IPOs. And it fluctuates considerably with what the uh, market looks like, but in general, that is the normal path to exit in this world. And if you look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, they have a nice survey of uh, entrepreneurs, people who are starting these businesses, and they all, 50% of them say, we're probably going to end up being acquired rather than doing an IPO. That's a very rare event. And so one of the things you have to be very careful about when you think about this business of putting restrictions on acquisitions, which has been mentioned several times, is that will really have a dampening effect on the startup companies for obvious reasons. In fact, here's a little chart of what venture capital finance of US startups look like. In this chart, the blue, dark blue line is in fact first round funding. And the light blue line is funding after the first round. And the black line is in fact the number of deals. So the blue bars represent amount of money, and the dark line represents the actual number of rounds. And as you can see, I think anybody would argue this is a very, very healthy market. We're seeing funding increase for this year. At last, we have exceeded the amount that was funded in the dot-com boom. And of course, the number of offers keeps going up, up, up. This is from the um, Dow Jones Venture Source data. So pretty reliable stuff. A lot of people have mentioned data, and there have been discussions about whether there are increasing returns to data. We might discuss this a little more in the conversation. I think any, any place you look on the web about how data is used, uh, there are diminishing returns, just like any other factor of production. This is an example from Stanford, the dog breed images, 120 breeds of dogs, 20,580 images. People use it as a test case to, tra to train AIs to identify dog breeds. No. It's, not, it, it, it's uh, not necessarily the highest priority question we might consider in the world, but it is a challenging question. And in fact, what happens there is the uh, mean accuracy goes up, of course, as you put more data into the training classes, but it goes up at a decreasing rate, just as any economist would expect. Similar example, this is ImageNet, which is the, what, the Super Bowl of uh, image recognition. There are 14 million labeled images. Google actually donated 9.5 labeled, million labeled images to the um, Open Image Group, where some of this data comes from. There's 1.2 million images available for training, and then they have 150,000 images for testing. And this is a competition, so what they wanted to do is they kept the data size constant, and p you just had a change from year to year because of uh, improvements in hardware, algorithms, expertise, but not the amount of data. Well, this was the most fruitful period for artificial intelligence research on images ever. You saw this dramatic improvement because of the rise of deep neural nets. The red line is human performance, so the machines are now beating the humans, at least according to the rule of the uh, ImageNet challenge. So there's lots of stuff that goes into winning. And in this particular case, it was primarily due to the hardware algorithms and expertise. I, of course, I'm not saying that having data is not helpful, just as in the previous slide, but I think you have to be realistic about what's really driving the uh, activity in this area. And finally, my last slide, there's a lot of stuff where people are talking about unprecedented behavior and giant firms and blah, blah, blah. But if you look at Amazon, it's less than 3% of the total value of all US stocks, AT&T was 13% back in 1932, General Motors 8% in 1928, IBM 7% in 1970. So it's not unusual. When you see a technological change, be computer maturing, automotive maturing, electricity, all of these different things, it's not surprising to see industry shakeouts where you get a relatively small number of superstars or survivors or whatever you want to call them. Revenue from top four companies in 1969, I can actually remember 1969, 
Uh, GM, Ford, G, and IBM, that was 5.4% of US GDP, 2% of global GDP. Now if we look at Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, it's only 2.9% of GDP and only 0.7% of GDP. So not very, not very impressive when you look at the uh, historical example. And in fact, the tech, telecom, e-commerce centers outperform the rest of non-health private sectors on almost anything you want to look at on wages, on productivity, everything else uh, has been a very uh, successful industry. Not to say there aren't problems. We've been talking about problems here, and I think many of them are real actual problems. We want a little balance to recognize these companies and this technology and this industry is really very critical one, and we want to make sure that you can have the reforms that you're discussing in a way that actually per, per, uh, increases that economic uh, dy uh, the dynamism that we see in these industries. So tech, what does it deliver? High wages, low prices, rapid technological development, uh, innovation, and quality. So it's an industry that I think we have to look at very carefully if we're thinking of changing the basic ground rules. So that's my 10 slides. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm David Dayan uh, with the American Prospect. We have Fiona Scott Morton here. Uh, and, and before I start, I, I do want to thank again uh, Luigi and Guy for a, another tremendous conference. They really deserve a round of applause for, uh, for putting this together. And one of the great things about these conferences is you have people with differing perspectives, and that's uh, always, always fun to, to deal with. So. Um, so Hal, uh, I want to start with something that you said early in, in the presentation that uh, you know, general purpose search is, is really a tough business. What was Google's annual revenue in 2018? Income or revenue? Revenue. Revenue, 120 billion. 136 billion. No. Uh, it, in what sense is a company that earns $136 billion in revenue in a year a tough business? Well, remember, we spent $75 billion that year to create the infrastructure and to employ the workers, and there's a lot of costs involved in doing this as well. When right. we go back to earnings, it's more like $30 billion. You just billion. put a, a slide up that just talked about revenue, though. So, I mean, do you routinely tell investors how tough business is? I didn't want to repeat myself, so I right. had talked about revenue and costs, and of course the bottom line is going to be costs. It's expensive to right. produce all of that, as, okay. as is true of But I mean, do you, do you tell investors this is a, a super tough business that we're doing? Yes. This is difficult. I, I read the transcript of your last investor call, and, and you know, I heard a lot about revenue growth. I didn't hear much about what a difficult climb it is. So I think you probably heard revenue. about TAC, about traffic acquisition costs, that's usually a theme in there because traffic acquisition well, costs. Well, I heard keep this is up. what I heard from Sundar Pichai. We feel very positive about the enormous opportunities ahead in evolving search and assistant. Uh, we, what gives us these opportunities is Google's position to help people, business, and society in countless ways through our products. So, so but, I mean, yes. saying, <laughs> saying one thing to investors and another to audi uh, other audiences is uh, the definition of securities fraud, but. <laughs> Putting that aside, uh, what I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand how how this is a tough business for Google. Because only six percent of the clicks actually bring in revenue. So if you're looking at, uh, let's say, a, a magazine, as you do, there's well, a big cost to producing that magazine. Only a small fraction of that magazine has the yeah. advertisements in it, which help pay the bills. Well, it's a bigger cost because we can't sell advertising. Um, so uh, Fiona, you you mentioned like the six percent. Uh, situation with the with the uh, six percent of the clicks are monetizable and and sort of making comparisons around that to uh, uh, you know billboards or yeah I'm, like that. I mean I don't think it's really the six percent that's interesting if your marginal costs are really low um, I think really we should be looking at return markups and profitability that's that's how we learn about how economic performance so the one issue about looking at marginal cost being really low when you add them all up, not just the marginal cost of serving, but all the costs associated with that, you get to $75 billion. So it's not a negligible amount of money that's ignorable, it's a big amount of money. So I think you can't have high R&D, you can't call those costs 
R&D and then get lots of credit for R&D and marginal costs and get lots of credit for high marginal costs. I think so, you have to pick one. So I looked at cost of revenue. <laughs> cost of revenue is the cost of running the data center, run, paying the people who are doing the search. Right, and so the fixed costs. R&D is a separate number. Okay. okay, so fixed costs, good. Well, okay. not really <laughs> because if you want if you get a lot more traffic, you're going to have to build an infrastructure that's going to handle that traffic. So it's not exactly saying it's uh, negligible. Those are real costs. Now, the R&D costs, as you say, they do fall into this other category, but you want to look at the cost of revenue, cost of R&D, separate things. Okay. So along, along similar lines, I mean, you put up some graphs about the diminishing returns to data uh, and, and, and how important other factors are, not, not data itself. Are those things that you show to advertisers when you're trying to get them to be interested just, in your business? Just to correct you, I didn't say not data itself. I said that there's other factors there in other addition things. to data. But I mean, the, the, the one thing with the right. dogs, you, right. it, it was about the diminishing returns to data. Do you tell advertisers like that Google's targeting doesn't actually get any better with more data acquisition? No. Is I mean, the, the question is, if you look at, let, let me spend a couple minutes to lay out sure. the baseline here. There's okay. The ad industry, which we just heard about in the last session, the first thing that was left out there was the contextual ads and the search ads. Now, the search ads are about 10 times the revenue of display ads, mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers from the 10K. And if you look at uh, contextual advertising, that's one of the biggest categories, not quite the biggest, but one of the very top categories in terms of display advertising. So if we look at the history, the way search advertising works is the advertiser chooses a keyword, let's say frying pan, and chooses a bid to go into this auction. And if uh, a user enters the term frying pan, then the query matches the keyword, the ad is eligible to be shown, the auction is run, and there's a determination of the, uh, you know, who gets the right. click. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, the ads are displayed, and then somebody might click on it, and that will be determined by the uh, auction arrangement I described. That was the first product Google had, and that is a great product. That's a really, really good product. Why? Because you're reaching the consumer right when they're searching for a frying pan. They say, you want a frying pan? Here are these sites where you can go get a frying pan. So that is by far the lion's share of our business. No personalization in that to speak of. Now, I could say that with 100% accuracy a year ago, but since then, there have been a couple little things where you can add demographic targeting. So you say, I'm selling cosmetics. I only want it to go to whatever women from 25 to 30 or that kind of thing. Well, that's kind of the, interesting. Let me, let me just uh, Well, well let me just say, that's the choice of the advertiser whether or okay. not to use that. That's not something Google, uh, right. Google provides it because advertisers ask for it. But we're not basing that on, I mean, what happens is the advertisers are the ones that use that. Right, right. So, but, but one thing I want to target in on is this personalization. Yeah. So. There was a study uh, last year from MIT and, and the Melbourne Business School, and it was looking at digital profiling, and it found that it was only able to correctly identify a, 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 a target's gender 42% of the time. So is that something you disclose to investors, that the precise targeting of consumers that you charge premium ad rates for identifies gender no better than a coin flip? So it is absolutely true there's a lot of noise in that in that identification. I'll tell you what I did is you, you can do it yourself. Go run a Google consumer survey. Say, are you male, are you female? See what they answer and compare that to what the targeting right. criteria say. It's better than 40, whatever number you mentioned, 47%. It's, it's, well, definitely, study, yeah, it's, 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 definitely, it's definitely better than that, but it's not 100% uh, right. accurate by any means. But before we get into that, let me just finish off my little yeah, taxonomy no, of the yeah, advertising. So. That's the search advertising. The next thing that's important to understand is contextual advertising. That was the second product we offered. The way contextual advertising works, if you're on a page about cooking, so this is what's on the page, the words that are on the page, then it's a good place to show a frying pan, okay, or whatever. You're looking at a bicycle site, we show bicycle helmets. This has been true for maybe 100 years, that uh, when you look at publications, they like to have ads that are contextually relevant to the publication. So you show an ad about vacations, you'll see ads for airplane flights and tickets and accommodation and so on. So I don't think anybody finds that objectionable either. And that's also an effective, quite effective way of targeting, okay? Right. 
But now the third one, which is what Alessandro and, and people were discussing this morning, was behavioral targeting, okay? So behavioral targeting is, here I am looking at this page about earthquake in Haiti, and you know what, there's no contextually relevant ad. You don't want Airbnb, most likely. You don't want uh, cheap tickets or anything, so what do you show? And the answer is, well, you could show something that the consumer looked at yesterday. That is, you could show them the bicycle helmet or the frying pan that they've expressed an interest in. Now, again, it's up to the advertiser whether they want to do that. It's up to the publisher whether they want to accept ads of that sort. You could just stick with full contextual ads and you do well, but everybody's trying to squeeze a little more value out of their expenditures, and some people find the behavioral ads are very useful. Okay. Well, real quick, and I want to get back to that, but you mentioned Alessandro. Are, are you willing to uh, provide the data that Alessandro needs to complete this study? Uh, is, would Google be willing to consider giving the data to Alessandro that he, he, he requires? Probably not. <laughs> because there is this little thing called GDPR, and if we've got personally identifiable data, we're not going to hand it out to Cambridge Analytica. Okay. You could anonymize the data. So you could, possible. but it's admittedly true you're still running something of a risk if the anonymization isn't perfect. In any event, I, we have done multiple studies inside. We published papers on this. You can look at the methodology. It's a good methodology. And, Advertising, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it depends well, a lot on the that's implementation. A, that's something that's interesting because yeah. uh, what we're doing to further this advertising is uh, essentially a, a, a deep surveillance and targeting of, of people in, in a variety of different ways. And I guess my question is, you know, what is this surveillance for if it's, it's not uh, completely uh, verifiable, working as intended. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, there's a quote from you in, in Shoshana Zuboff's book, uh, <laughs> which credits you as one of the founding fathers of surveillance capitalism. Uh, there mention. you go. Uh, Me and, and, the quote, and the quote <laughs> is, because transactions are now computer mediated, we can observe behavior that was previously unobservable and write contracts on it. And then you go about to say that, that you can track the price of pork in hundreds of stores in Shanghai uh, that was previously you know, unavailable to, to people to get that preciseness. Can, can you explain why this sort of panopticon of surveillance of everyone at every time in exchange for insights into the price of pork is worth it for society? So there's a number of things that have been conflated there, but let me, let me try to answer the direct question. Unconflated. Best, best thing you should do is you can go to Ads Preference Manager, just type that into Google, and you will see a list of your interests as perceived by Google, as seen as the um, types of web pages you visit. Now, somebody mentioned earlier this losing control of the audience, I think, uh, back there. It's not the publication, it's not any of this other stuff, it's just this page is about bicycles, this page is about motorcycles, this page is about whatever, and so and so. And you can look at that, and there's a long list, a long list of about 15 or 20 different categories that you cannot target on because they're too sensitive. And go look at it, it's all there in the documentation. Go look at your own uh, interests and say, is there anything there that I really feel embarrassed about revealing in public? And the answer is definitely no. I guess I'm struggling to reconcile that with the Associated Press story last year that found that Google was tracking user locations even when users opted out. Like what is that? That's that, that sort of knob that I'm supposed to click right. to, to change my settings. What does that actually mean if, if, if those revelations exist? Yeah, so, uh, well, what happens is on this location tracking issue, uh, if you ask people, do you want Google to track your location? They say no. If you ask people, do you want Google to tell how long it's going to take for you to get home under current traffic conditions? They say, oh, I love that. Now there you've got encrypted data, you've got all the things you could imagine that you could use to make that data personal, and what you're using it for is providing the service that people really value, namely measuring the speed of traffic by looking at how fast Android devices are, are moving, 
uh, looking at the speed of traffic and looking at how long it's going to take you to get home. But does so people mean like that off? surface. Does oh, off if mean it, off, or does it off mean off until you until we think you it, want it? In this particular case, I think what happened was the interpretation given by the designers was that this is whether you want this human readable form available to you. And if you turned it off, turned it on, then it was still being collected. It just wasn't being translated into this human readable form. Okay. I think that I think it's fair to say that that was a mistake. That was not a good interpretation of that uh, particular choice, and it's been changed now. And so I think okay. we're at peace on that one. Right. I've talked so, too much. Yeah. So I'm gonna have um, I wanted to ask a question about the. It was reported in the Guardian, I think, by the um, about the Oracle people who did a study that says even if you say no to everything. Your Android phone reports on your location, the near nearby Wi-Fi beacons, atmospheric pressure, your speed. Are you in a bicycle or a car? Or a, I believe it's a, a every, gigabyte of data every month uh, this harvest. So, so, so that you can't opt. A person with an Android phone can't opt out of that in any way. Well, right? somehow air pressure isn't really personally identifiable information, is it? Well, it t tells you whether you're on floor 26 or 1. So it, it does say something about location in 3D environments. I, I'm a little skeptical about that, but maybe, maybe you're right. The uh, question there is, um, I haven't seen the Garden, Guardian article, so I can't really respond to it. It but basically there, says what I just said. Yeah. So, there, so, <laughs> so there, there is a lot of information that's being collected about the environment, that information is useful for this kind of traffic issue I described, for weather uh, events, for all sorts of different things. And I will say, this is an issue in an engineering company, a lot of times they think about the option value of data. Well, it costs three cents to put in this barometric pressure, why don't we do it? Or put, to put in this compass, or to do that, and to do this. <laughs> On the other hand, I think it is fair to say that, yeah, you can turn most of these things off, in my understanding, and if it's a case where there's something you want to turn off that uh, you can't, then I think you can well, you know, get a different phone or file a complaint or something. Paul Ohm on the last panel mentioned yeah. how there was, there's, there's no right to location privacy in, in, in federal law. I mean, philosophically, do you, do you think that there, sh there could be or should be, I should say, a limit to this data harvesting? Like, should people in an emergency room be getting ads from law firms? You know, I mean, it, how, how much of this data is enough? I so, guess? a mobile phone cannot work without the cell towers. Of course. The cell towers determine the combination of cell towers providing the routing to the person. And if you have a mobile phone with no location in, uh, detection in it at all, it's like a brick. So the technology says, yes, you've got to have something that indicates how this call is going to be rooted. Right. And in many cases, you want to know directions, you want to know this, you want to know that. There's lots of things that are potentially valuable for you in the, with this mobile device. Now, the question is, do you want that mobility or not? You can turn all this stuff off, and then it's a paperweight. Is it a viable concern? I mean, oh, yeah, you, no. If people, do if, it, if people don't want it, they shouldn't have to endure it. Because I have another quote from you where you say, digital assistance will be so useful that everyone will want one, and the scare stories you read today about privacy concerns will just seem quaint and old-fashioned. I, I still stand by that. You do? Yeah, I think, I think that people will find these services so attractive, like the cellular phone service, they understand that there will be records kept of, their, of, of who called whom. Remember the Boston Marathon? No, 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 let me finish. Answer. Remember the Boston Marathon sure. uh, event? Well, within a half hour, I had the list of all the phone numbers. They had the list of all the phone numbers that the suspects had called. Uh, during the last several weeks. So there's lots of issues involving law enforcement, there are lots of issues involving uh, security, where for one reason or another, rules have been set that enable access to this content under think certain your conditions. Do you companies should be the ones making that decision, or should society and democracy be the ones? Well, that? of course, society should determine those decisions, and right now, I think everything we do with this data is, in fact, perfectly legal. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, I'm in the, the journalism industry, so I have a particular uh, interest here. Um, uh, re reports uh, have indicated, and, and this sounds at least directionally correct to me, that publishers earn something like 30 cents out of every dollar spent on, on brand advertising. Display advertising. Display advertising. Right. So 
is, is Google keeping the other 70 cents as, as their cut, or can Google not take down the sort of friction of that transaction below 70 cents on the dollar? Because Silicon Valley, uh, typically, uh, you know, tech firms tell us that, that, that we get to do frictionless transactions. That's, that's one of the, the benefits of, of, of your, your, your industry. So I haven't seen that article either, but I trust you summarized it accurately. The actual numbers are Google keeps 30% of the display advertising, 70% goes to the publisher. This is an audited number, it's in the 10K. You can read it, it was $12 billion went distributed to publishers last year, and this year it'll be even larger. So it's a pretty good revenue sharing arrangement. It's known as traffic acquisition costs. Uh, it's there under the Google Display Network, it's in the 10K, there it is. So that, that number conflicts with the French government study, with uh, other sort of private communications I've had, with the report from, I can't remember where else I read. So let, but number, let me ask but, you, are these but explicitly much, using Google or are these using some other mechanism? Uh, I mean, doesn't Google have like a 95% share? No. Oh. Uh, that was, that's the other thing that, uh, so I think some data to shed light on this would be really helpful. I mean, hiding behind GDPR is not helping with the public debate. If what so is being printed is Google has a 98% share of search and keeps a 70% markup, and that's what everybody says, and you don't think it's true, if you say it, it's just how am I supposed to believe that? Because it's of course in your interest to say that. So I'd love to believe you, but I think somebody's got to find some verifiable data somewhere so we can get an answer. Because 70% so, is a very, just let me say, 70% is a very large markup. So if it's 70%, then either Google it needs some competition to drive the markup down, right? Or Google isn't very good at its job because it's taking 70 cents out of a dollar to put an ad somewhere, which is another kind of problem. But if it's not 70 cents, then neither of those things could might be true. So it, I just would really like to know. Well, you have to pose a question accurately. Okay. So remember I talked about search advertising. We have a big share of the search advertising market. I think there's no question of that because we have a very successful search engine. We have competitors in various search engines. Bing is a competitor. Uh, Baidu is a competitor in some parts of the world, etc. That's one piece. The other piece is the display advertising. Remember that's a tiny part of our business. That's about 5% uh, of our business. So it's a much, much smaller amount. And in that display advertising, the audited numbers from our 10K say exactly what I said. It's a 70% to the publishers, 30% to the user. And by the way, that's the baseline. If you're a big publisher with a big audience, then you can negotiate a higher rev share. And every place you've heard of, every publisher you've heard of, actually has done that generally. So then I have a question. Would the publisher have to pay for publisher tools out of their revenue share? To what? Publisher. Let's say, imagine the publisher has some publisher tools that they use to manage their display advertising. Does their 70 cents include the payment that they then have to make for the publisher tools, for example? Well, no, we don't have, we don't provide the publisher tools. What happens if you're just a, if you, you can, by the way, you can have ads yourself just by putting a little bit of uh, JavaScript in your page. Google will fill it with ads and then they'll send you the revenue share. Uh, at the end of the month. So anybody can get this ad. That's the beauty about it, that the uh, contextual advertising is very, very easy to uh, well, I, I want to ask something about that because yeah. the, in the rollout of uh, your, your new privacy initiative that, that came out last week, uh, one of the elements of the rollout involved disabling third-party cookies mm -hmm. in, in Chrome. And am I, am I right in believing that Google would still be able to track users through a variety of means, but uh, should I be happy as, as a journalist that my, uh, the value of any kind of uh, uh, cookie or whatever that I could use it has been nullified, but Google continues to track, Google continues to benefit from ad targeting, uh, and nobody else does except for Google within the Chrome environment? So again, I want to emphasize with the contextual ads, which is what we're talking about, that's, right. that's the contents of the page. It doesn't have anything to do with the identity of the user. It's going to show you generally the same set of ads, no matter who, who you are. And that's not impacted by this issue at all. What's happened is there has, it has been a rising concern about privacy. 
Uh, Apple made this move when six months ago, something like that, and there have been calls for us to do to allow users to disable if they choose the, those those cookies. So, yeah, it's going to make things hard for everybody in the advertising industry, or harder. But, but it's not going to make it that much harder for Google. Well, it's tricky because what are how are you going to do the tracking then? But you're how? talking to me specifically yeah. as an advertiser? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you could do it for logged in users who've already logged in and established identity, but that's only a fraction of users. You don't need to log in anything to use Google. So uh, it's a, it, it would be a K, I'd have to look at the details to try to understand this, but I, I can tell you well, it's that a, decision was made because of calls for increased privacy. Right, but those calls for increased privacy are also about the, the, the privacy of users reflected in Google. Anybody uh, on in, Google can disable behavior targeting at the click of a button. In fact, when you again, look at the ads... Okay, wait, wait, wait. I actually did it on the way to the conference, and yeah. it is not a click of the button. I just want to say for the record, it's like 28 clicks of the button. No. Uh, yes. You yeah, go, I mean, you're all, smarter than me, so you probably all, can get there faster. All you but, do uh, definitely is go, a lot go of to Ads Preference Manager. You can look at the interest. If you wanted to click each interest off uh, one by one, you could do it, but you could turn the whole thing off. Well, again, click. I guess I'm concerned about the continued targeting after things have been shut off that 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 history and and how that relates to how many things I can turn off and feel really good about it uh, but what's the reality so what we do is if you go to the ad itself you're saying why are they showing me this ad I'm annoyed with this you click in the upper right hand corner and you see an explanation of where that ad came from not all ads can come from Google when you turned off this behavior targeting you turned out Google's behavior targeting yeah, okay. I tried to turn off the list of 73 peop guys yeah. who d have belonged to the ADA thing. Yeah. And uh, I went away and thought for a while and came back and said I could turn off 32 of them, but the other 43 was temporarily unavailable to be turned off. So that I, I don't think that's your fault. I think that's the intermediaries who sign up to be voluntarily good and then decide not to be when somebody wants to opt out. Can, can I ask someone how much time we have left? Because I want to leave some time for, for uh, individuals uh, in the audience. No one is giving me the answer. How, many how much time do we have left? 120. Oh, OK. OK, so we have some time. OK, good. Uh, you said you wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really interested in the. Yes. No, I get I'm really interested in your idea about diminishing marginal returns to data. Mm -hmm. So, of course, economists believe that kind of thing. In the report that I uh, chaired and presented yesterday, we talk about increasing returns to dimensions of data. Right. So, of course, if you've got the same guy doing the same thing, eventually it's not useful. But if you add location to purchase intent, then that's different. Or if you add a different type of user, then that's different. Okay, but you seem to be... so. A, you said it seems like we're moving toward algorithms away from data. And secondly, when I went and deleted all my stuff from Google yesterday, I observed that the closest in time I was allowed to delete was three months, which I, you had the choice of not delete at all, delete after 18 months, delete after three months, but there was no delete after three minutes yeah. option. Is that a dark pattern? So no, I, no, 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 hang on, so I want to finish. That so that works. strikes me that three months, um, I'm wondering if that's a, a reflection of the lack of usefulness of the data past three months. Mm. And the second part of my question is, if you were the regulator and you were trying to promote entry, do we learn from this choice of Google that three months is the amount of time that the data needs to be saved to give to the entrant? Like, we don't need to worry about giving the entrant a year of data. We can just give the entrant three months of data because that's all they need to be effective. Okay, so again, there's a couple things that have been confounded here. Last week, we announced this new option that you could delete after 18, three months or 18 months. And th they said they'll be adding more in the future. That was what was possible to do now. That's not the deletion I'm talking about. I'm talking about the deletion of deleting right now. You can go there, you can say, I want to opt out of behavioral targeting, or you can click on the ad and say, don't show me this ad anymore. You've got these various forms of control, but that's always been available. What we're doing by this uh, 18 months thing is saying, you can set it automatically to forget all your data. You don't have to remember to go in and click on it yourself. So those are two things, and maybe it is a bad interface. I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but those are the two items that you're discussing. Now, the freshness, very, very important. Remember the search ads, they're really valuable because they're offering you a product that you're searching for right now. And, and that is 
Very, very good. Now, Amazon can do that as well, of course, because you're at the point of purchase. So you've got somebody who's in market, to use the marketing term, and that's the time that they need it. The interest or the value of the, of the data that I'm sh looking for shopping uh, for a frying pan right now, that drops off very, very quickly. I mean, just think about yourself. I want to buy something. How much time passes between having that thought and actually buying it? So yeah, the fresh data is really important. But this business of moving from a world where there's been a lot of discussion, <clears throat> the Vestager report, for example, had a lot of discussion about data. I'm wondering if that's yesterday's problem and tomorrow's problem is the algorithm, not the data. So again, I want to emphasize data is useful. Data is important. What you were describing of finding new features, that's the name of the game. It's generally not making more observations, but adding new features and it is making the data wide rather than long. So completely agree with that point. And the important thing about building these models is finding features that are predictive of the, of the problem you're uh, trying to solve. So the data will still be uh, an issue. But anybody who wants to enter, let's say, the search market now can enter it in a few hours. Hmm? And like, get share? Like so, so you're saying like uh, in that, that slide that you had up about all this, um, uh, the, the kill zone, how startups are entering a certain market. So if, if I put up the graph for startups developing search engines, would that look the same as the, the market for startups developing AI? I didn't say developing search engines. <laughs> I said entering the market. And what you do is you go get uh, AFS from Google or whatever the equivalent is from Bing and you stick a little piece of JavaScript in your page and then there'll be a search box and you get half the revenue from well, You're telling me about the theory search. and I'm telling you about no, the I'm practice. talking about the actual practice. And what happens is you go look at a company like DuckDuckGo. Sure. Did they develop a search engine? Indeed they did and I use it. Yeah, but they didn't actually develop the search engine. Most of their search results are coming from Bing. Right. So what happens is, same thing with Quant, the French example. The French example is a nice one because not only are they using the um, Bing as an, aff an affiliate to provide the search results, they've also been named the official search engine for the French government. And where's Jacques Premier? Back there, yeah. And, and hasn't the French government got a lot more efficient since that uh, requirement? No? Don't know. Right. Anyway. Uh, I have a couple more questions about your slides, and then I want to open it up to yeah. uh, the audience. Oh, by the way, DuckDuckGo is a, is, is very, it's a very interesting company, and I have a lot of respect for the uh, founder. They've been profitable for five years. There you go. Okay? So if you want to get in the search business, you can do it. The challenge is not building the data center or building the software, any of this stuff. It's getting people to come to your site. Right? It's a fixed cost, but it's like the traditional fixed cost of saying, well, I have to let people know that I'm here, and I have to have an angle where people are going to prefer my product to other people's product. Well, right now, privacy that, is a good that's, angle, that's, and what they've done is they've provided this privacy-enhanced search, and they make money doing that, it. That's yeah. kind of in the zone of, of, of yeah. network effects. So let me ask just a couple questions. One was about, uh, you, you listed in one slide all this competitive behavior between the leading tech right. firms. And under social networks, you cited Facebook and Google. Oh. And you know, Google Plus shut down last yeah, month. Yeah. You might be aware of that. Yes. Um, so I mean, even more than a month ago. I but think. but I don't just want to talk about you updating your slides. Yeah. But <laughs> what does it say about this industry of social media that even a company as prominent and as large as yours could not penetrate social networking? I don't think we had a very good strategy. I'm not saying the game is over in that respect. I'm just saying uh, we came out with a tool. The tool wasn't as effective as been hoped, and so we pulled that back and do something else another day. And I do apologize for putting that checkbox in there because it is, it is more than a month old. I am old. in journalism, so fact yeah. checking. Good is for important. you. Me too. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in economics, so I fact check as well. There you go. Um, OK, so uh, a couple more things on the slides. On, on, uh, there was that, that slide about acquisitions, and yeah. you talk about how these were low employee companies. Do, do you think the number of employees is the right expression of the value of the company? Like, YouTube didn't have many employees at the time, but 
but Google bought it, and, and I, I, don't, I don't see that as a trifling acquisition. Well, it's a good question. Do you want the FTC to examine acquisitions involving three or four people? I don't see how that could possibly work. Well, uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, we the question is the market budget. itself, not necessarily the employees you know, who are in that market. If, if YouTube is a, a, a site that has a certain number of val uh, amount of value and then combining it with a Google, create something that, that could cause anti-competitive harm, isn't that an issue? So do you remember what YouTube was like before it was acquired? No, I absolutely do. Yeah, it was a disaster. <laughs> I mean, it was a mess because we're all- well, Why was it so important then? Why did you have to buy it? Because it looked like if we made an investment in this and cleaning up the copyright issue and making the performance work, we had the data centers, we had the, the uh, transmission capability, and we thought we could turn that you know, that should company into should a, the authorities be able to make that determination as well as you? So, you don't, the the, no, they can't, not, of course. No, the authority is not saying, here's what's a compliment for Google. The authority is saying, left to itself, would this site develop as a competitor to Google? That's the, that's the relevant right. well, question. Well, and I think the answer to that is, when you look realistically at it, if someone, didn't have to be Google, it might have been Microsoft, stepped in and fixed these problems, then it had a chance of being successful. If nobody did it, it was, it was gone. Okay, uh, I, I think we're gonna go to uh, the audience uh, now for some questions, and there are quite a few, as I okay. suspected. Uh, I'm gonna go back here with uh, Ashkin. Hey, Hal, so, um, so there's GDPR, there's the California law, there's all this concern about privacy. Um, you just des described search ads, contextual ads, and display network. And I think for a lot of people, the kind of externalities, the, the surveillance economy externalities are in that third party uh, kind of display. So at what point do you essentially give it up? Do you say that, you know what, the harms associated with sharing data with third parties and cross-site tracking and the invasion of privacy is not worth the marginal benefit from, from that technology? At what point do you say, you know what, we're gonna be leaders here and do Focus, as you describe, and, and those numbers, I think, make sense in some, some sense. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so it's a good question, and of course I can't answer it. But I will say, <laughs> I will say, because I'm not in the position to make that decision or determination, that's, some, that's uh, above my pay grade. But, the, but I will say, the question of when is it worth turning off, remember there are two important parties here. There's Google, and then there's all the publishers. So the publisher are getting $12 billion a year, from this service, they like it. They like having that extra money. You can look through the publisher and say, well, yeah, that's worthwhile. I mean, there's some that aren't worthwhile, but there's some that are worthwhile. And so the question is, if you turn it off, you're turn off, turning off a significant revenue source for uh, publishers. Maybe they'll get over it. I mean, it's not a huge revenue source, but it's a significant source, $12 billion. Yeah, did you want to I, say, respond? I, oh, you cut did him Did you off. have something to say to respond to that? Yeah, here's, here's, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I, I don't talk for all publishers, I work for News Corp, but I think there's part of it is a prisoner dilemma. I mean, if, if like any publisher would be leaving, the, the demand would be going to someone else, and it's very hard. 12 billion for the industry right now is a lot of money. Um, I wanted to ask you on the revenue share, and you said uh, there was this debate 70, 30, 30, 70. Just to be clear, it's a question I've had for a long time. Is revenue what is coming from advertisers? or what is coming from another branch of Google? No, no, it's just from the, it's just from the advertiser. Generally, clicks, you know, you can sell display ads on an impression basis, or you can do it on a click basis. You can even do some things on a conversion basis, where you see the actual conversion act that the, is, is being advertised, and that's revenue from the advertiser. The revenue comes in from the advertiser, goes out to the publisher, we keep 30% uh, on average, uh, that's also the base. I think the lowest you can get is 32%, uh, uh, I believe. I have, I, the documentation is online. You can check this. Uh, but the, uh, there are some publishers that are big publishers that have a higher uh, revenue share, and uh, the average co turns out to be basically 70%. Yeah, or 30% to Google, 70% to the yeah, publisher. Let me go here and then to Carl. Um, how would, would you generally agree that um, that 
the page rank algorithm is still sort of an efficient matchmaking system. I'm sorry, I missed the word there. That the, that the page rank algorithm is still an efficient ma matchmaking system. Patreon. Page, page, rank. page, page rank. rank. Ah, page rank, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you, you yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, I was doing a, uh, I was reading the reviews of the Gleacher Center on uh, Google's uh, Maps product and uh, saw a snippet of reviews that said, excellent and impressive meeting location for groups of around 150. So I decided to copy and paste that text into the Google search bar in quotes, and I got a result that said no results found for excellent and impressive meeting location for groups of around 50. So my question is, what is the efficiency justification for Google de-indexing its own content from PageRank? I have no idea. That's a pretty technical <laughs> question. If I had to speculate, and you're kind of asking me to speculate, PageRank is a big calculation. It doesn't update uh, on a second-by-second -second basis. It's something that takes days to run. So it's continually running, but whatever goes through PageRank isn't going to affect rankings for, for there, a period of time. There's literally none of, none of the content that Google collects is actually technically part of the World Wide Web, is, what, is my point. It, you have robots.txt your own content, and I'm just trying to understand why Google does that to its own uh, corpus of content. If the idea of PageRank is to help match users with the most relevant information across the web. Well, I'm, I'm still not sure I completely understand the question, so maybe we should ask it in more detail Take it later. Offline. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Carl. Robots <laughs> TXT, the, the question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, that is a very tough question, and a lot, de and, and a lot, <laughs> a lot depends on, on what you mean by equally. For example, <laughs> no, no, I, I think it does, because, because, for example, if I pull up my phone, I could say sushi near me using Yelp, and it would do exactly what I ask it to, namely search Yelp for sushi near me and show me the results. So that's a nice example. Whatever you're asking your assistant, it's going to use the feature that you ask it to use. Now the question is, if somebody goes to Google and types in sushi near me, then the question is, well, who's going to give you the first answer? What's a, uh, you know, where's that answer going to be? You've gone to Google. You're searching Google. You want to see the Google results in our view. So it's a case where you have to decide if they go to this site, and they execute this search or this uh, query, then you would expect that query to be executed on that site. So the question is, you don't want to disable people or push them way down the list or do some kind of discrimination of that sort, but if they come to your site and ask a question, then it seems to me you're the one that's answering the question. So that's a, that creates a very powerful role for the search engine because that means that anyone who's coming to the search engine is announcing to Google that they want to stay inside the vertically integrated organization for the first set of results. Right, and never, what happens for And Google? no matter what they're looking for, right. if Google's vertically integrated into it, yeah. they're gonna get that. So if you go to Yelp and you issue this question, sushi near me, using Google, you won't get any answer at all because they won't obviously aren't looking at the Google pages. This is what Bing does, this is what Baidu does, this is what everybody does. In the industry, if you come to me to ask the questions, I'm going to answer them to the best of my ability and then provide all these other answers as well. So I understand that people can argue over this, but if you went to Google and you said, uh, you search for directions and up comes a Bing map, then people would say, what? You know, where'd that come from? Uh, I'm going to go back here to Dean. Okay, I have a question. So Google does all of this stuff, but it makes almost all of its revenues from advertising. It doesn't only sell its own ads, it also runs ad networks where it sells ads for other publishers and other companies. It then runs the auctions and the auction algorithms that pit the buyers against the sellers. There's no transparency in those auctions, even though Google's running the auction and also selling next to other sellers. 
do you think it's legitimate that buyers, sellers, and regulators would want transparency as to what's happening inside those markets? Well, I can plug a paper I wrote on this topic. If you look at uh, position auctions, it gives you a nice uh, examination of what, uh, you know, how those auctions work in theory. And there's also been a lot of uh, work in practice in this area. You probably know that last week Google decided to shift its uh, final auction to this first price auction in the interest of providing more transparency. That is, we were asked about this issue and it was felt that Google, uh, the second price auction was too manipulable. And so after a lot of consideration, we said, let's go to the first price auction for that final stage. So this system is evolving. These are cases where people said, we don't like this aspect. We thought about it. We said, okay, you have a good point. We're we'll implement it this way. There's still complaints about the first price auction. You don't eliminate complaints. It's just you're choosing to tilt things one way or the other way. So that's where we are. I mean, you've got this thing. I don't think, I don't quite see how you could reveal a more transparent auction because then what would happen is you'd know everybody you were competing with on every auction and there would be an issue of collusion and there would be an issue of this and issue of that. You can't just say, I don't like the status quo, let's try this new thing. Well, you have to think about what the new thing is going to do too and it can have negative consequences. Uh, let's see, we have a few more minutes here. Uh, Jonathan. Just two very quick questions. First is, um, I think there's some confusion around, you know, the the role of the ad exchange and the and the and, and the role of TAC, which is used to, to drive traffic. So, maybe one question fundamentally is, does Google also buy um, ads on the open exchange and then resell them through AdWords? I don't believe we do, but I don't know that okay, for a fact. So I, I don't know why I would want to, but. Yeah, so Ad, does AdWords bid for inventory that's coming off the ad yeah. exchange and then um, and point it to the So, market. So you mean AdSense for cert, AdSense for content? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, so if I, if I go to buy um, ads from, from yeah, AdWords, that, that am will I go... buying ads that are coming off the Google exchange? And if so, how does that, now are you buying and selling ads on the same exchange and how is all the revenue calculated? So that auction uh, of moving the AdSense for content, it also participates in the double-click auctions, and there's a formula because in that case, we're on both the buy side and the sell side. And the in exchange. the other cases, we're usually either on the sell side or the buy side, so there's a formulaic uh, apportionment there. So, so but, like, how does that work in like commodities auctions? With, well, forget so, it. So yeah, I, I think this is too detailed for the audience. <laughs> And me. All right. Well, um, uh, I, I think we only have time for one more. Yeah. So yeah. actually, this word. is not a this is not a question. I just want to thank uh, Hal Varian for stepping into the lion's den <laughs> of uh, David and uh, Fiona. Hal didn't have any conditions. I'm, not, I'm more of a lamb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hal didn't have any conditions. We, you know, we told them David and Fiona are going to do it. He said just fine. He yep. just came in free. If we will, we had other people from other platforms that we wanted to have here, and they didn't come. So I think uh, Hal deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> I, Thank you. I appreciate your time. All right. Good. I think that's all. I really appreciate your time. Good. Thank Good. Thanks.